How? How is this possible? You guys made a game where you had to fend off mechanical tentacles before they could sexually grope the protagonist, and where an elementary school child was consciously promoted to the head of a robot manufacturing department, who single-handedly created the Monokuma zombie apocalypse, and yet you still managed to concoct a story worse than that heaping pile of rotten garbage. Literally, how did you do that? I'm actually kind of impressed. I have never in my life watched, played, or read any form of media that has left my brain in as much of a state of disbelief and disarray as this cognitive dumpster fire of a television series has. There is so much to go over here that it's going to take me 12 parts releasing every other day to get through it all, with each video covering one episode from each distinctive arc. I'm honestly still trying to convince myself that this wibbly-wobbly excuse of a narrative I sat through actually happened, so strap in everyone, this is gonna be a doozy. If we recall, it took Danganronpa 2.5 all of one whole minute to break reality, so let's see if we can get a bit further than that this time. Let's see if we can make it five minutes without anything going wrong. Let's go, let, let's, let's see if we can do it. We begin with Makoto being arrested for committing treason against the Future Foundation and- Wait, what the fuck?! I shot? Really? You you couldn't even make it past the first five seconds? Oh dear lord, what have I gotten myself into this time? Okay, so this random guy we've never heard of before thinks that Makoto Naegi, the ultimate hope- No, I'm not calling them super high school level anything no matter what you try to tell me, show. And who defeated Junko Inoshima twice, has betrayed the Future Foundation in their quest to restore hope to the world. Now, you see, I'd love to get into his reasons for believing that and how they make absolutely no sense at all, but unfortunately the show cuts away immediately after he labels Makoto a traitor because apparently we needed a teaser trailer for the episode, so you'll have to wait a few minutes on that one. So then there's this little prologue that shows off how the world is still falling apart at the seams, and it's mostly just an intro before the intro that's meant to get you hyped up for the show. I can't imagine there's really a whole lot for me to talk about here. But like a phoenix from the ashes, humanity's last hope rose to fight the super high school level despairs. Y y <sighs> like a phoenix rising from the ashes. <laughs> You're not even trying to hide it anymore. Then we get an opening credits title sequence that's genuinely really fucking cool with an awesome theme song that I sadly can't play for you or else the copyright squad will come fuck me up, and it really got me hyped to watch each episode. It's got some neat animation with a rockin' underscore to boot that I really adored watching and listening to. Unfortunately, the show begins after this. So then the episode starts proper with a board meeting at the Future Foundation, and we meet the new team of idiots that are being introduced for this show. No, you did not mishear me. We meet an entirely new team of idiots being introduced specifically for this show. Instead of focusing hardcore on fleshing out the returning characters that we've known and cared about since the very first game, they chose to create an entirely new group of people to accompany the returning characters for the final chapter of the trilogy. Mm. This scene moves so goddamn fast I genuinely think they might have been trying to break my neck. Every single new character is introduced in a matter of seconds, and the show wants you to immediately commit all of them to memory, despite the fact that the show grants no more than a line or two to each character before moving on to someone else entirely. See, the first two games also had a scene like this where you would go one by one introducing yourself to all the characters. But the reason why this works in the games is because you, as the player, Player, are consciously selecting which character you want to interact with. You get the chance to talk to each one of them individually and participate in detailed one-on-one -on -one conversations that give you the general sense of who they are. They don't just flash them up on the screen for two seconds and immediately introduce someone new. They allow you to slow down and get a feel for every single person in the room before you actually progress with the plot. But because this is a TV show and we gotta keep the runtime cut to exactly 24 minutes, we don't have time for deep introductions. Gotta keep that pace moving at breakneck speed. It's almost like this should have been a video game or something like that. This new girl's name is Raruka, but because I miss her when I first watched the show, and because of how appropriate the name is, given how much of a bitch she is, I will instead be calling her Veruca. Anyway, Veruca expresses concern that the remnants of despair could easily kill all the leaders of the Future Foundation in one fell swoop since they're all gathered in the exact same location. But the main leader, who I will be calling Old Guy, assures her that this location is not on any maps, and therefore they can't be found. Um. What? No shit, Sherlock. I don't think anyone thought you went to Rand McNally and just said, Hey, can you please put us on your map so the remnants of despair can come and kill us all? I'm pretty sure she was more concerned with the question of how could this place possibly stay a secret? How could a building this dominantly displayed ever be kept off anybody's radar? You literally have spotlights illuminating the damn thing. You have helicopters flying around which could surely be picked up by air traffic radars that you'd think any remaining remnants of despair might want to keep an eye on, since they would surely know that the Future Foundation has an army of helicopters at their disposal considering how little they tried to hide their presence in Toa City. In fact, you may even be wondering about the construction of this place. As in, how could they not have noticed the building physically being constructed which would have required many trips back and forth between locations? Well, you see, the show actually has an explanation for that one, but you'll have to wait until the end of this video before we actually get around to it. Then they start talking about how they need to murder all the remaining remnants of despair, and this chick in the back instinctively turns around in fear upon hearing that statement, so, uh, she's evil, in case you didn't catch this incredibly subtle reveal. There are budgetary concerns. Wait, wait, what? What? 
budgetary concerns? You, you, you have a functioning economy in the zombie monokuma despair-inducing apocalypse? H haven't governments crumbled as a result of the events of these games? How is there even a budget for you to be worrying about right now? And even if there was a functioning economy, you're worried about your budget? When your entire purpose is to rid despair from the world by any means necessary? What the fuck? How is that your primary concern right now? Your foundation exists to defeat despair. Shouldn't your budget be entirely dedicated to that? Then they talk about complete and utter nonsense for way too goddamn long until the super cool new character shows up. The Steel Samurai. Oh, are you wondering why I'm calling him the Steel Samurai? Oh, you'll see. Next episode. Then he tells them all for talking about complete and utter nonsense when they should be focusing on ending despair and you're almost about to relate to the guy until you realize that there's no fucking way he heard what they were talking about. No, you did not hear a single thing they were talking about from the goddamn elevator. That did not happen. Nice try, show. Next, we finally get to hear about exactly why Makoto is being labeled a traitor by the Future Foundation and the answer is so dumb it'll just make you want to jump off a cliff. It turns out that Makoto's heinous, irredeemable crime that makes him a traitor is restoring the personalities of the cast of Danganronpa 2. WHAT?! I'm not fucking kidding here. They show all the characters from the second game up on a screen and then they say, These are remnants of despair Makoto Naegi willfully kept hidden. Do you fuckers hear what you're saying? Makoto took those characters to Jabberwock Island, plugged their brains into the Neo World program, and then restored all the personalities of the ones who survived the killing game, but sadly couldn't save the ones that didn't, because surely this series wouldn't be so dumb that it would revive the people who died or anything like that, so that they could be good again. Or, in simpler terms, he did something to bring more hope to the world, which is what your organization is all about, and you label him a traitor for it. What? The. Fuck. How are you idiots not seeing a blatant contradiction with your own values here? Capturing the remnants of despair is something you should all be proud of him for, right? You know, getting despair off the streets and into a secure location? You were just talking about apprehending them all not two fucking seconds ago, so I know damn well you see eye to eye with him on that front. Ah, but maybe you're saying, dude, come on, they brought about the end of the world, they need to face justice for their actions. To which I would say two things. One, why do you live in a world where facing justice and turning to the good side are two mutually exclusive things? You do realize it's possible for them to help the good guys in their quest to rid the world of despair, but still ultimately face the consequences of their actions. Right? In a time when the Future Foundation needs all the help they can get, since clearly the majority of their employees are fucking incompetent, why would they be mad at the idea of having more hands on deck to help them win this war? Two, in terms of the remnants of despair actually being accountable for the actions they undertook, I want you to hold on to that thought real tight, because it's gonna become really relevant when we get to the end of this godforsaken series. Old guy reasonably says, Makoto defeated the ultimate despair, you idiots. But then Veruka says that that might have just been a red herring, that maybe he didn't really defeat Junko and Ashima. What? What the fuck do you mean maybe he faked her death? The entirety of the first game was being broadcast live on television. How the fuck could he have faked it? It was live for everyone to see. She died on the air. Everyone saw it. It's revealed in episode 11 that you fucks were watching the show. What are you talking about? Then a girl wearing a face mask who I will be calling Corona mentions how she wishes she had a truth. Serum. Mm -hmm. Also, yep, truth serums exist now. They just do. Because fuck you, that's why. I'm sure something like that would never have been helpful at any instance before in a series about deducing the truth behind murder mysteries. Surely medicine like that wouldn't have monumentally altered the stakes of the first two games in any way whatsoever. Then Makoto, Hina, and Kyoko show up to the party. See, the reason that they were running late to the meeting is because Makoto had to remember to put on his plot armor jacket before he left home. Honestly, though, I'm already feeling so much better with these three on screen because they were the three best characters from the first game, and I do not think it's by coincidence that they are the three that they chose to bring back for the final act. Unfortunately, that feeling of contentment is immediately ruined when the Steel Samurai orders the ultimate boxing champion, whom I will be calling Matt, to place Makoto under arrest, and now I just want to fucking die because I'm back to thinking about how your motivation for wanting to arrest him makes no fucking sense at all! Hina justifiably sticks up for her friends and she's one of three people in the room with a functioning brain. Matt tells Makoto that it's nothing personal and that he doesn't want to put a hero in handcuffs. And you start to think that maybe you'll like this character because he actually feels sympathetic towards Makoto. That maybe he doesn't really want to do this, but simply has to because of the chain of command. But then that gets immediately ruined when he fucking gut punches Makoto! Why does he do this, you may ask? See, Makoto, too, was tricked into thinking that Matt was a sympathetic character. He began to think that he might actually be able to appeal to his sensibility, but was immediately gut punched for having faith in the writers. A fatal mistake in the world of Danganronpa. Kyoko goes off on Matt for punching a defenseless man, then he responds by saying, He's got no right to defend himself! <laughs> 
you did not just say that sentence out loud. The writers did not put that line into the script and expect me to think that the Future Foundation are the good guys in this story. Hey, remember 15 seconds ago when you were like, it's just business, and now you've suddenly grown a massive hate boner from a coat? Oh, what the fuck is wrong with you? Then, as if that wasn't enough, Hina justifiably defends Makoto when Veruka throws a fucking knife at Hina! What a little bitch! Now you're silenced and nearly murdered just for speaking up to defend yourself? Remind me, again, who the good guys are supposed to be in this world. Fucking hell. Then a man wearing a cow mask. No, I'm not kidding. He has a cow mask. No, I don't know why. Let's just call him Moo Moo. Moo Moo says, hey. Not cool, bro. And then the Steel Samurai says that Matt needs to take 17 chill pills, yet he conveniently waited for two punches to go by before actually speaking up about this. It almost gives you the impression that he actually wanted him to assault Makoto, but don't think about it, the new characters are so cool and awesome and you're gonna fucking like them whether you want to or not. Kyoko then becomes Mia Fey and says the defendant is in no condition to stand trial, to which Matt says, Screw that. I barely touched him. WHAT?! You fucking gut punched him and then bashed his face in! He's bleeding! What do you mean you barely touched him? Wait a minute, why is the blood red and not pink? So then the trial is suspended and we get a scene with two new characters who are in a relationship, one of whom is a steel samurai and the other of which is evil girl from earlier, and then there's a setup for something he wants to discuss with her that never comes up again, so what the fuck was even the point, and then she goes to check on Makoto. Next we get a bathroom scene where Hina talks about Makoto's situation with Kyoko, who says, I wouldn't be surprised if I'm suspected of working in collusion with Nayagi to hide the remnants. Um... Kyoko? You did help him hide the remnants of despair. Why exactly aren't you and Bakuya standing trial with him? He wouldn't have been able to pull this off without you. Actually, wait a minute, how exactly did Makoto manage to pull this off? Wouldn't these people be here every day actively trying to rid the world of despair? And if they have to go off-site for a mission, would they not be required to call back to headquarters or check in? How could three of their most intelligent members possibly disappear off the face of the Earth for the at least three-week period during which the remnants of despair were plugged into the Neo-World program without anyone at the Future Foundation noticing something was amiss? Where'd they get the transportation methods to even get Get to the island in the first place. Presumably they would have taken one of the Future Foundation's boats because how the fuck else would they have gotten something of this size? So would the Future Foundation have not noticed this? Would they not have sent units to the island to try to stop Makoto? No? Whatever. We get a nice bit of character work between Hina and Kyoko that sadly doesn't last nearly long enough, and then we jump to Evil Girl asking Makoto about why he did what he did. He understandably explains that he wanted to restore them to the people they used to be before they fell to despair, and then Evil Girl gets way too close to his face as she tells Makoto to try to see the situation from the perspective of the man who placed him under arrest for trying to save the world from despair. Wonderful. We then meet the ultimate animator, who I'll call John Lasseter for reasons that will become obvious at the end of the show, and now there's an earthquake happening. Just like that, there's an earthquake happening, because fuck you, that's why. And these tools just stand around like statues in the middle of an earthquake! What are you cocks doing? Drop to the ground, cover your head! Why are you just standing around? Did you not learn basic natural disaster preparation at any point in your life? But how Hina reacts to this event is even worse. Not only does she remain on her feet instead of on her knees, she tries to open the clock closet door in the bathroom, which then causes the dead bodies of the security staff to fall out. No, I'm not kidding, this actually happens in the show. God damn, that earthquake must have really rattled our brain around inside her skull a hell of a lot because she appears to have lost any intelligence that she previously had. You're not supposed to stay standing during an earthquake, dumbass. You're not supposed to be in a doorway in an earthquake, dumbass. And you're certainly not supposed to try to leave the fucking room by opening a door to go to a different room during an earthquake. Dumbass. Why is this door even unlocked in the first place? Would the janitor have not locked it? All this nonsense are the only reasons why these bodies even get found in the first place. Brilliant. Then we cut outside Yasuhiro, who isn't in the meeting with everyone else? Why? Why would he not have been in the meeting where his friend is to stand trial for treason? Bakuya and Toko are in Toda City on a mission, but why wouldn't he be there? He's not busy with anything, he's just sitting around doing sweet fuck all! Oh, is it so we can keep the number of primary characters at 16 because for some reason the writers can't function unless they have exactly 16 people in the game? And so they boot Yasuhiro out of the story because otherwise you'd have to, god forbid, axe one of the new characters in favor of a returning character from the first game? What a horrible thing you'd have to do. We then see him trying to predict the future with his crystal ball, which nullifies his character choice at the end of the first game, but who fucking cares because the Future Foundation is under attack! I- I don't- it- what- how? Do you people not have countermeasures in place? What happened to that helicopter we saw flying around earlier? Are there no defense mechanisms? No missiles of your own? Shields? Flares? Fucking anything? It sure would be inconvenient if you forgot all about your own helicopters just so the plot can happen. The chopper pretends Yasuhiro doesn't exist, which is interesting considering what happens later, and then launches a missile at the school. He then drops his crystal ball because he is a fucking idiot. Turns out it wasn't an earthquake that struck the building, it was just an assault helicopter charging into the scene. Here, 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 criticism invalid, it wasn't an earthquake. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. The characters would have 
had absolutely no reason to assume this was anything other than an earthquake, and they all acted like idiots when faced with that situation. Then Makoto and Evil Girl returned to the conference room. Why? Isn't he supposed to be under arrest? You know, in a holding cell? Awaiting trial? Gee, I wonder if there are gonna be any plot-contrived reasons for him to be brought to this specific room. Steel Samurai then says that the reports are just coming in now, which makes no sense at all, because if there are people in a position to be able to report the information they see from outside, then how didn't they see the helicopter coming a million fucking miles away? Who's even reporting this information? Are they in the building with you? Are they somewhere else? Because if they're in the building with you, then why aren't they with you right now? And if they're somewhere else, then why aren't they sending backup to help you out? Do they not care about you at all? Then we meet Nutcracker Teeth, who says that every possible way out of the building is buried under rubble, which... Ah, uh, just how the fuck could that have ever happened following a singular missile strike? And if they fire missiles at every single entrance, then how have you not mobilized your own helicopter to stop this by now? You clearly have plenty of them on hand ready for use. What are you doing? Then Veruca gets gloaty with her, I told you so, attitude about how the remnants of despair would obviously know about this place by now. And Corona says that the reason why they found them is because the enemy has a mole in the building. Now, they probably found it because you couldn't possibly be trying any harder to be noticed. You may as well put out a big ass sign that says, we're over here, come kill us. Then they immediately blame Makoto for the attack because they are fucking morons. If anyone is to bear the blame for this attack, it'd be you since you're the one who that brought him here in the first place, leaving open the possibility that your helicopter would be tailed. And as I already mentioned, Makoto is the one who defeated Junko and Ashima twice on the air. Literally, why would he ever bring the remnants of despair here? I swear to God, nobody ever thinks in this fucking universe. So it turns out that the comms are down and they can't call for help. Please remember this for later. And then old guy says, That is not a a good sign. Oh! You don't say, buddy! Lassiter then shows up to the meeting and apologizes for being late, but then old guy reacts with surprise that he's here at all. Let me say that again. Lassiter walks through the doors and apologizes because of how late he is, implying that there was a time he was supposed to be here that was prearranged by old guy since that's who he was addressing, and you cannot be late for something that you weren't supposed to be on time for in the first place, and yet old guy is stunned that he has arrived at all. Keep this in mind for later. Then a Pokeball spawns into the room, and so they all fall asleep, including Corona, who doesn't know how to wear a mask properly, and because of this, she also falls asleep. It needs to go over your nose too, you Neanderthal. And no, I am not lying about this. I'm being completely serious. The Pokeball just appears out of nowhere. It doesn't come out of the wall, it doesn't drop out from the ceiling, and it's never revealed at any point throughout the series that anybody in the room secretly threw the thing, it just appears. Then Monokuma arrives in the scene, because who the fuck else would it be, even though Junko Wenoshima is properly dead this time, and Monokuma was her creation, he's just here somehow. I have no fucking clue why it's Negan Rampa, so Monica would just has to be here, I guess. Also, I know this doesn't have anything to do with the writing, but his new voice actor is just awful, and it makes him sound like a rejected Sesame Street character. Your buddy, Monokuma, will always come blazing back! He always comes back. Mm. But then someone asks, Who are you supposed to be? What? The first killing game was broadcast all over the world. How the fuck do you not know who Monokuma is, you diseased gremlins? So then he says that he's gonna host another killing game because of fucking course he's gonna do that. You treat it like a game. You millennials are super into that kind of stuff, aren't you? Ah, <laughs> kill me. And then they discover the evil girl is already dead. Awesome. How did nobody notice that body hanging from the chandelier until this exact second? And thus ends the first episode of the show. Needless to say, we are not out to a great start here, folks. Granted, it's just the beginning of the show, so there hasn't really been enough time for things to properly start breaking yet. But given what little story we've seen so far, things are not looking bright. Maybe the despair arc will be better. Let's see how this one begins. Aw, bummer. Guess I died. What? She's watching her fucking death scene in a movie theater. I don't- What? Why does this scene exist? Could you not think of any better way to transition to the despair storyline than by breaking the fourth wall to say, Hey guys, by the way, we're gonna skidoo into the prequel story, hope you don't mind, woo! Anyway, we get another awesome intro and theme song. I mean, genuinely, these opening sequences might be the absolute best parts of the show, but the fact that I've said that at all is pathetic. Have you ever heard anyone say, Oh, the best part of Gravity Falls is the title sequence? No, no you haven't. So this is gonna be the story of Evil Girl from the future arc, whose name is actually a Athena Sykes as she gets a job as an assistant homeroom teacher from... Kyoko's dad. Well, oh, 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 that's gonna be a big ol' yikes for me, dude. Can we get an F in the chat for Kyoko's dad? Then we meet the main homeroom teacher who will be acting as the classy hat-wearing mentor and close friend of the father of a genius inventor, and he will therefore be called Ray. Athena punches herself in the chest and knocks the wind out of herself 
somehow. She shows up for her first day of class where it turns out there's only four students present out of the entire class featuring <laughs> Hiyoko calls Athena a stranger because apparently their main homeroom teacher failed to mention that he was being replaced for the foreseeable future and then she says Ooh, this one looks like she'll be fun to break. What do you think will go first? Her social life, her health, or her sanity? Good lord, she was a terrible person even before she entered the simulation. Oh, but fear not, friends, because it turns out that Athena doubled down on health insurance and brought the papers to prove it because she was expecting this question, I guess. Except that health insurance is gonna do shit for you if she literally drives you insane or makes you lose your social life, you clod. Then Mikon shows up late to class and somehow manages to trip and fall over while standing perfectly still, not even moving an inch. No joke, she doesn't even take a single step forward. She just doesn't move at all and then somehow... Wait a minute, Mekon tripped and fall, that means- Oh no! Oh, why am I even surprised at this point? These are the same fuckers that made a boss fight where you lose a piece of clothing for each hit you take. Anyway, they then force you to stare at this image on screen for far too goddamn long while I introduce the ultimate nurse. We then learn that apparently this preparatory high school housing the most elite of the elite whose entire mission statement is trying to prepare everyone to become the future leaders of the world. Nobody gives a shit if you actually attend class or not, which explains why nobody else is in the room right now. So, okay then. So then Athena realizes how much of a heaping mess she gotten herself into and thus dons her housekeeper uniform. As if your skills as a maid are gonna help her form a group of class-ditching delinquents, you fucking tool. Then... she does... this. You're a bag of rotten oranges! Mm. Seriously, you're not even trying to hide it anymore. Like, it was never exactly subtle, but this is just a whole other level. Then Sunny is surprised by this word as she's never heard of an orange before, and so we get a shot of a censored orange because apparently fruit is offensive now, which is interesting considering the very next words out of Mikan's mouth are... <laughs> The fuck? Who wrote this dialogue? So then Athena goes completely fucking insane and decides to drag everyone along for the ride on a magical quest to find their missing friends. Like it's a tutorial level designed to get you used to the controls and hub world. Gee, it's almost like this should have been a video game or something like that. But before we begin, I need to mention that Fuyuhiku says nah to this quest, and so Athena pulls a fucking knife out of her ass and tries to stab Fuyuhiku in the hand? What the fuck? Peach, you don't got the stones. Oh, I was wrong. And then suddenly he becomes a groveling dog who's more than ready to go on the quest? I- he, what? What the fuck just happened? The ultimate housekeeper turned teacher had a knife on hand, ready to go, ready to pull it out on a moment's notice? How the fuck did you get this job? Why is the Yakuza gang leader suddenly petrified by someone wielding a knife? And why would you even be afraid when you have your personal attack dog nearby to- Wait a minute, why the fuck isn't Penko here? She literally attaches her entire existence to keeping you safe. Remember in Danganronpa 2.5 when Penko was stalking Fuyuhiku's every move, ready to kill Nagito if she needed to protect him? Remember in Danganronpa 2 when Penko killed Mahiru and sacrificed her life off for the sake of protecting Fuyuhiku? Yeah, well now she's just fucked off somewhere and thus the scene is allowed to happen. Cool. And so the adventure begins with their first stop being the bathroom in search of Nekumaru. See, this is funny because of that scene from the second game where he had to take a dump really badly and thus that has become his entire personality. He's just always in the bathroom. Great. Quality writing, folks. Athena even says, And I was so sure he'd be here too. It how? How are you aware of everyone's personality traits and habits when this is your first day on the job? And why has the ultimate team manager been reduced to- Lol, funny man needs to do a poop, please laugh. So then another earthquake happens. Oh god, Jurassic Park! So, you've heard of Jurassic Park, but you don't know what a fucking orange is. Okay then. And they still refuse to drop to their knees during an earthquake and so Mahiru fucking dies. And then, fucking then- Nekumaru takes a dump that blows up the fucking door and sends a shockwave throughout the school and he blew out the fucking wall and destroyed the toilet just by taking a dump. What in the holy is the fucks is this scene? Somebody had to actually put this in the script. Anyway, next up on the list of characters to collect is oh, this fucking chode. But believe it or not, for the first time in the series, somebody actually holds him accountable. And it's Athena, because of course it fucking is, who accomplishes this task by by tying him up and yanking on the rope that's suspending him from the ceiling, thus causing him to be sexually stimulated. Who wrote this? Are there no actual cafeteria workers present here? It's just terror terror, really? All right, two down, now it's time to get Akane who- Oh, hell yeah! Someone had to animate this. It was someone's job to animate this. Someone got paid 
to animate this. Akane then becomes fucking Spider-Man and climbs to the top of the goddamn school building. I, I, I don't, you, what, what the fuck is going on? Did you get bit by a radioactive spider when I wasn't looking? How in the world did you do this? But she doesn't stick around to admire the view for long because she smells food and wants to eat the meat and thus she jumps off the top of the building to eat the meat and shows she fucking dies. Oh wait, no she doesn't because Nekumara becomes supersonic and self-destructs which causes a chain reaction all around the school which somehow leads to Akane being tied up and nailed to a fucking cross? What? How did- what- what is this show? What am I watching? Is this real? What in the world is going on? I did that, whatever. Three down. Okay, moving on. It's time to get Kazuichi, and this time the plan is rather simple. Simply plop Sonya in front of a giant, nondescript machine, and Kazuichi will just magically teleport into the scene. Question. Since we know that Kazuichi revolves his entire life's purpose around winning Sonya's heart, why the fuck isn't he in the classroom with her? Oh, by the way, Akane's still fucking nailed to the cross, so, you know, that's cool, I guess. Anyway, it turns out that Kazuichi reeks the motor oil so badly that it causes Sonya to defy the laws of physics and teleport backwards away from him like a reverse Enderman. But fear not, because Athena is also Darth Vader and thus had a gas mask in her back pocket ready to go. Apparently. She just had that. Because fuck you, that's why. Now it's time to rescue Tanaka, who is apparently resting atop the temple from the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and so our heroes are attacked by bats before Tanaka decides to announce his presence because he is a fucking asshole, and then they go home. Now it's time to recruit Ibuki to join the knockoff Avengers, who has a fucking flamethrower underbarrel attachment for her guitar?! Let me say that again. Ibuki has a flamethrower attached to the underside of her guitar, and is using it to cook food. No, I'm not fucking kidding, this actually happened in the show, and then we get this set of cringe lines. Huh? Let's stick it to the main by attending class. Oh my god, who wrote this dialogue? Why do you also have a guitar in your magic bag of tricks? What else you got in there? Is there an ice cream truck in there too? Maybe a bazooka? How about a Ferrari? You got a Ferrari in there? Then they go off site again. So for those of you keeping track of their path movements, they went from campus to the Temple of Doom, back to campus, and are now leaving the school grounds again to go find Peiko. Hey, whatever. Peiko is trying to find her inner peace, but it's interrupted by Athena, who almost dies because of it, but she doesn't because she hasn't lost her plot armor yet. Fuyuhiku asks how Athena even knows about the roles of the accusers in the first place. Before we can get an answer, Ibuki tries to fucking kill him because he had the nerve to ask a question about the plot. So, you know, that's cool. You're, you're really cool. Then Hiyoko says that she's perfect just the way that she is, which is the funniest joke in the whole show. And then Terra Terra slides onto the screen and says, is right now. And then he gets yeeted through the wall by Peiko stick which Athena is now shown to be holding. Yes! More of this, please! More of this sack of shit being punted through painful services, please! Now it's time to go get everyone's favorite prick, which Athena is trying to track down with the use of a book. No, I don't know what this book is or how it's helping her find the next person we're trying to find, but who the fuck cares, because the script is about to completely fly off the rails again. So they're all trying to find Nagito, and Kazuichi decides to take a break from searching for a bit, and then, a giant fucking truck leaps over the hill, like Lightning fucking McQueen, and crashes into Kazuichi, and so he fucking dies. Or at least he should die, but instead he just cartwheels through the air like an asshole with his friends all calling out his name because apparently they're all just immune to being killed by vehicles despite the fact that they're right in front of him walking along the same path as him and should have been in the trajectory of the truck too. But what the fuck ever, I guess. But you better hold on tight because we're not done with the stupid just yet. Nagito is trying to buy a soda but whines about being unlucky after the vending machine jams and then the truck lands on top of the machine, which then causes the number on the screen to display 777 like a casino slot machine machine, and thus every single can in the machine comes pouring out at once? <laughs> what? What in the world is this dumpster fire ever seen? How did this truck leap over the fucking hill? What was it doing so close to the goddamn sidewalk? How did Kazuichi not fucking die? How did no one else get hit by the truck? How did this truck smashing into the machine not cause all the sodas inside it to crumble to pieces since it's, you know, a truck? Why would you ever program this? Why would you want this to happen? Why would you want someone to be able to pilfer your entire supply with one fucking dollar and a quarter? What is even happening anymore? This is episode four. Fucking one. This is the premiere of the show. So just you wait until we get to some of the later episodes. Trust me, this shit is nothing compared to the insanity that's gonna unfold later in this stupid series. One scene later, Nagito somehow managed to carry all these cans back to the classroom and Kazuichi is all bandaged up. What? How? How could he possibly be in any condition to still be at school? He should be in the emergency room right now. He was rammed into by a fucking truck. Even if it turns out Mikan has the magical ability to heal him back to full health, which surely wouldn't be a thing. Surely even Dang and Rampa wouldn't create something that allows you to instantly heal yourself. Why aren't you still searching for the classmates? What did returning to the classroom accomplish? Oh yes, and uh, one a minor point here. Uh, how have you not been fired yet? It's your first day on the job and one of your students is already the victim of attempted vehicular manslaughter. Then Athena pulls two swords out of her ass and threatens Kazuichi with suffering. The man who not five fucking minutes ago got rammed into by a truck because she is a fucking psychopath. And so she leaves her class behind and tells them all to clean up the classroom for her while she goes off to finish the quest alone, probably so she can hog all the XP for herself. 
But before we can actually watch her finish the quest, Mikon slips again! She fucking slips again and somehow manages to jam one mop between her rotten oranges and another one underneath them. I just, I don't, what is, what is happening? What is the script? Who wrote this? How is this only episode fucking one? We then meet the ultimate animator, but as we know from both the beginning of the future arc and the second game, this is actually the ultimate imposter, and so we shall call him Among Us. Among Us doesn't want to go to school, and so he tries to escape his room out the window, but then she teleports outside the window, despite the fact that not one second ago she was yelling at him from the front doorway. <laughs> hey, so you know that episode of Tiny Plans where this dumbass thinks his front doorbell is actually his back doorbell, and so the only way to get his attention is by putting one person at each door? Yeah, well that's this, only instead of it being an intelligent solution to a problem, she just fucking teleports. Cool. Characters can teleport now. Why the fuck not? One more student to catch and my work here is done. Catch? What is this, fucking Pokemon? You're describing this quest as catching students? What is wrong with you? Oh my god, none of this makes any sense. It, uh, hey, maybe the next scene will be better. Hopefully, please. Please let the next scene be better. We save the main character of the second game as the last stop on our little quest here, naturally, and as it turns out, this is the scene during which he meets Shaki Nanami for the first time. And so we get the sense that the focus of the Despair Arc is going to be about learning how the two of them- Wait, what the fuck? Chiaki is here?! What in the fuck is Chiaki doing here?! You know, the AI? that was created specifically for the Neo World Program, and who Monokuma had to create a fake profile for, and who they made a big deal about in the second game because if they restored those school memories, they'd forget all about her because she was never a real person, and how she wasn't fucking in Danganronpa 2.5, which is entirely derived from the school memories? Or in other words, the fact that she was never a real person? Did you actually play the games before you wrote this shit? Or did you just completely fucking forget the end of the second game? Well, we can't do anything to change it. Shocking He's a real person now. Awesome, dude. Cool. Uh, great. I, I, you love to see it. Well, if nothing else, her presence should at least make the experience more tolerable since she's the best character they've ever created. I highly doubt there'd ever be any scenario in which adding her to the show would end up giving us one of the most horrific scenes in the history of Danganronpa. I'm sure this will be great. Hajime immediately gets a huge boner for her and she reciprocates these feelings because, you see, she's the ultimate gamer and Hajime recognizes the sound effects in Gal Omega. And thus, he too is a pro lead gamer and this makes Chucky lose her collective fucking mind. But, all kidding aside, it's genuinely kind of heartwarming to see her get so excited over this. Over seeing someone else share her passion for games, except- HOLY FUCK GIRL, GET AWAY FROM THE GODDAMN CAMERA, PERSONAL SPACE PLEASE. But I hope you weren't enjoying seeing these two sweethearts bonding over a shared passion because Athena Sykes comes in to fuck it all up, literally dragging Among Us across the sidewalk, probably destroying his face and suit in the process because she is a fucking psychopath. Then we get some dialogue about how Hajime is wearing the uniform of a reserve course student's department is solely for people who get to attend the academy through paying an exorbitant tuition. It's actually fairly well constructed and you kind of start to feel for Hajime a little bit. But because this is Danganronpa, the sincerity of the moment is immediately undercut with a joke because Among Us got sick of playing his game and decided to become Sonic the Hedgehog and instead and spin dash away, which then causes Athena to run after him and the conversation ended. No time for self-reflection, no time for character development, this is a TV show we have a time go to edit down to, damn it, gotta keep things moving at breakneck pace. It's almost like this should have been a video game or something. Fucking hell. Chiaki then tells Hajime not to worry about not being talented because he has more freedom than she does despite the fact that Mahiru said earlier that the students are literally allowed to skip cuts all they want, but Brad's dead. Yeah, sure, we'll go with it. Putting that inconsistency aside, though, this dialogue is going to create a much larger inconsistency later in the game. A much, much bigger problem that's gonna make you want to smash your fucking TV to pieces. So please remember this scene, because the show will want you to forget that it ever happened. Then Athena comes back having already tied up Among Us because she is a terrible teacher, and we actually get a character moment. Chiaki, the girl who absolutely refuses to acknowledge the world outside her game and not look up for her screen for any reason, waves goodbye to Hajime as she's being hauled away by this absolute psychopath. It's not much. It's just a wave. But it is a small shrivel of character. It's a sign that he means enough to her that she was willing to acknowledge him, even outside of her game. It's something. Which is more than I can say about roughly 90% of the scenes in this goddamn show. Then we return to the classroom, which is now squeaky clean, and because they spent the whole day going on a Pokemon quest, the school day is over, and now it's time to go home. But not before we see that Chucky is playing on her Game Girl Advance made by Nintendo. Sadly, though, the episode isn't over yet because we still have one more scene featuring the skilled samurai who is revealed to be overseeing the construction of another Hope Speak Academy location overseas. And, uh, in case you haven't figured it out, this location is what will become the setting for the future arc. Which means that this building wasn't being constructed during the tragedy, and thus the writers have explained how the remnants of despair wouldn't have noticed them constructing the building as well as how they got the resources to build it in the first place. Except for one small problem. If this building had already existed as the overseas location for Hope Speak Academy, then how the fuck would nobody have thought to check this place as a potential hideout for the good guys? Why would you not think to check this place? 
I, I don't know, man. If I were Remnant of Despair and I saw that both of the teams that are currently fighting to defeat me originated from Hostpeak Academy, and I knew that there was a secondary location that was never officially opened, I don't know, man. I'd want to go check it out just to see. Fucking idiot. They did find the building. Criticism deep. Bond. Yeah, you hold on to that thought real tight. We'll revisit it in the final episodes. And thus concludes the first pair of episodes for the series, and good lord almighty, what a shit show. And you may not think that anything's been too drastically broken yet, and you'd be right for the most part. The show's only just begun, after all. They haven't had all that much time to fuck up yet. But trust me when I tell you, if you have not already watched this show, you ain't seen nothing yet. This show is the single worst piece of content I have ever seen in my life, and it is single-handedly responsible for bringing the Danganronpa franchise to its knees, mercilessly tearing down every character that stands in its way, annihilating the world building, and telling a story with holes large enough to fly a plane through that permeate every goddamn episode. So strap in, everyone, because we are just getting started. Thanks for watching, everyone, and I will see you all on Thursday when we tackle the episode 2 pair. Goodbye!